So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for the ones of you who do not know me already, my name is Gianfranco Cecconi. I'm part of uh, the Capgemini Invent team uh, that leads the consortium that runs for the European Commission uh, two projects uh, that are relevant to the topic we are going to discuss today. Uh, the first one is the European Data Portal. Uh, since six years ago, uh, the biggest initiative from the European Commission for the uh, promotion, redistribution and support to the member states in publishing public sector information and open data for the citizens to freely reuse and transform in uh, new businesses, in awareness of how um, your governments are doing, in planning and anything really, it's open data. You can do whatever you like with it. And the second project, um, Support Center for Data Sharing, more recent, about two years old, uh, to take, let's say, that kind of support to citizens and businesses one step forward and help you find out when you cannot make it open, how uh, more restricted forms of data sharing are still available to you and enable you to start new businesses or, um, or <laughs> anything really. Uh, data is such a fundamental resource in the digital strategy for Europe and in everyday lives. Sometimes it's just a matter of getting aware of it. Uh, today, we have as our guest, uh, Casey Abernethy um, from <laughs> Uh, uh She will uh, tell us about a very peculiar, I would say, um, a story in the uh, open data ecosystem in Europe, that is the one of our organization. Um, but I don't want to spoil it uh, too much, so I, I will actually let uh, um, uh, Casey introduce herself straight away. Casey, welcome. Tell, about, okay. tell us about you. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the introduction. And also I'd just like to start off by saying thank you for inviting us to take part, a, part in these data talks. Um, we think it's a fantastic initiative for bringing all different European institutions closer um, to find out more about open data in different places. Um, I'll start off by explaining uh, a little bit about what is our CDA. So our CDA, its full name is Multisectoral Information Association, and we are a professional, multisectoral and non-profit association. Um, we were formed in 1999 by the merging of three different information associations that already existed. And from our beginnings to this day, um, we are dedicated in, prom in promoting the reuse of public sector information. Um, to put it basically, uh, we act as a lobby, defending and representing the needs of our associates. Um, we strive to gain and improve access to information um, that is of our members' interest, and they then go on to use this information to develop uh, value-added products or services. Um, it's really, really important to note here that although we represent our associates and their interests, um, all the information that we request is then um, published in the open data portals here in Spain, so at a national level or at a regional level. So we don't have like any exclusive agreement. Um, and like, for example, we are registered on the European Transparency, Re Transparency Register, and we're also in the same registers here in Spain. So yeah, everything's pretty open and we try to be really, really transparent. Um, we have some associates that are not only from Spain, but we've got a couple of other European countries um, included in our list. Um, and all our companies that are associated to our CDE um, are reuse or intermediary companies. So for those that don't really know the word, it's uh, intermediary, we say it's companies that collect and analyse and process information from the public and or the private sector as well. So, and then they go on to use the value-added product. Let me take a step back just to be sure that all of our friends in the call actually uh, get what, what we're talking about here. So yeah, it's, it's you, hard to explain. <laughs> because even I, the first time I had, uh, perhaps because it was, I said, yeah, it was the first organization of this kind, I bumped mm -hmm. it, I thought, did, am I getting it right? So this... Uh, you talk about lobbying. I, I, I tend to... Yeah, it's like a bad word, isn't it? Yeah, There's exactly. All I, old, my, my, wife taught me, my wife taught me to use the word advocacy. Advocacy. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, so yeah. you're an advocacy organization made by 
private companies, right? Private members. You're not a yeah. government association, nor a no. semi-government association. No. And and you um, advocate for mm -hmm. Spanish government Company. open data to be released for, for for the Spanish citizens to use and businesses, right? Yeah, so mainly for the businesses, but then as an add-on, because it's been open for our associates, it's then open for the community. Of course, yeah, if it is open, so, it's, it's open, right? Yeah, and, once it's open, it's there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and you've been around for a very long time, you said 1999. Uh, yeah. What was the, the idea you started from? How it was formed? Uh, what was the originating idea? Um, I think if we go back 21 years, um, it was really formed because there was there was a need. So I think if you look back 20 years, uh, technology was starting to boom, information was becoming more important, and um, there was a lot of barriers to the reuse of public sector information. So I think it was really um, a group of uh, different associations uh, thought that they could merge to be stronger together and to really, really start breaking down some of the barriers and to really invest, investigate into this sort of new area, so to speak. So it was strictly driven by the fact that, that the organization that at the time made a sedia or the, whatever it was called at the time, many years ago, they realized that there was the need for, to put some pressure on government for the data that was very, very needed to, to be left out, as simple as that. In a way, we, we have seen a lot of this by say non-profit or uh, let's say citizen-based organization usually mm -hmm. more rare to see it from from industry association and this is why it surprised me the first time it, it's not common <laughs> with and, something different <laughs> yeah i mean I, I would i would definitely say it's a model i would like to see more often there is no reason why uh, we will, we shouldn't bring um, industry association to push uh, for more open data and better open data to be released can, can you name a few of your members just to give us an idea of who we can find within a set um, all, all of our members you can find them on our web page um, to name a few is probably a little bit delicate sometimes <laughs> um, so they can all be found on our website but I can explain a little bit like uh, our members are all companies that have come from the different sectors in the information industry so to give you an idea um, within us ADA we have broken them into different sectors because so we can completely represent their needs um, so for example the different sectors of the, the companies that we've got in our CDA is we've got the um, Bureau of Credit, uh, the Credit Bureau, um, the companies that provide information on equity, solvency and credit. So we've got a couple of those in the mix. Um, we've got different commercial information um, companies as well. So they're companies that analyse um, other companies and they analyse the market to be able to create reports that can help other companies or citizens in making um, decisions. Um, we've got the electronic information sector as well, and here they manage computerized registries and databases. So um, these databases offer information regarding directories, other companies, marketing. And um, the other sector that we have is a technology sector, the information technology sector, which are companies that give technological solutions um, that's aimed at the mass management of information. So they process large volumes of information, big data, and so on, that sort okay. of thing. So that, uh, that sort of covers all of um, the companies that we've got. They belong to one of these groups. And I get your point that without knowing um, the Spain, it's difficult perhaps to understand what their role is, even if you made specific names. So your, your intro is, is perfectly covering the, the other question <laughs> I made. You know what they do. And go onto our webpage. We've got them all in the part under the associates. And you can click onto all the web pages from our web page as well. So, if I wanted to be a difficult journalist investigating that said, yeah, I would then ask you, okay, but what's the business model? What 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 pays for your activity? Uh, what are okay. your interests? Yeah. So, the, our business model, um, we do lots of different things here in our CDA. So, if you go back to the the different sectors that we've got, um, this brings us to that interrelated um, through our different working commissions. Um, so this brings us to the day-to-day -day working of the association. So we've got, I'll outline some of our principal commissions so you've got an idea how they're sort of formed and what they do. We've got an uh, information sources commission. So it is largely formed by the product directors of our associated companies. 
and they mainly identify the data sets that they need to develop their products. So these data sets are then analysed and access is sought or improvements are communicated to the public sector. Um, then we have our legal commission, that's really important <laughs> now. Um, it's made up of legal directives, uh, directors, sorry, legal directors from our associated companies. And one of their main tasks is to give us feedback to whether there's any laws or regulations that impede the opening of the data sets that have been identified by the previous commission. And they also give us different feedback on different um, public consultations that we participate in uh, regarding data protection, the reuse of information, transparency, and so on. They're all the different sorts of regulations and, and laws that are related to the businesses of our, or the day-to-day -day business of our associates. Um, another commission that I could mention is that's been recently formed is the Infomediary Sector Code of Conduct on Data Protection Monitoring Commission. Mouthful. <laughs> plan, without interruption, it's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the motive of the, I had to practice that one. Um, the motive of this creation, um, the creation of this commission was a recent GDPR. Um, and it's to be able to follow the compliance and the good practices of the regulation within our association. So I'm, I'm not sure if you know or anyone out there listening knows that last year our CDA was awarded for our initiatives and the best adaption to the European data protection regulation by the, the Spanish Data Protection Agency. Um, and like the good practices and our actions you can see on our web page as well. We've got some things there. That's nice. So, so that'd be sort of the, our three working commissions. So that's um, one part of our business model. But then if you go to the other side of our business model, it's, it's um, collaboration with the public sector. So I'll probably speak about collaboration a bit because it's one thing that we really, really focus on. Um, with our work, with our commissions, and also with our participation in public sector working groups, um, we've, we're seeing that the sector's needs and our sector in general uh, is unknown at times. Um, the sector can be a little bit difficult to explain to people outside the reuse community. I've seen this firsthand in the years that I've been working in RCD. It's like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, <laughs> where do I start? I know the feeling, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then you sort of get from, from the public side of it, from the public sector, we get questions like, why do you want these data sets? Um, what are you going to do with the information? Or even things like, what is the value of the sector? Or what is the value of opening this information? Um, so from there, we started to create different ways in which we could answer these questions. Um, for example, we've identified... I think 70 to 80 different data sets that could be of interest to our sector at a state, regional and a town council level even. And um, as a way to really, really showcase the sector, in 2009 we celebrated our first annual international conference on the reuse of public sector information. So we've had speakers from different Spanish ministries, regions, from different public identities, from the World Wide Web, even from the European Commission, um, from Latin America as well. And this year we're currently um, organising the event, but it's a little bit different this year due to the COVID because we've got to, yeah, it's going to be virtual, which means that everybody from all over Europe can, can join in and see it. So um, we should have some information available soon about that, so look out for that. Um, another thing like in our model is we really, really want to be able to show people the, the value of our sector, um, the economic value of our sector. So what happened is we noticed that we were still getting the question like why this information, what value has it got, what value is it giving to the sector or the economy here in Spain. So what we did is we, in 2013, we put together a report on the Spanish infomediary sector. Um, this report is produced annually. Um, this year was in March, and we had a virtual presentation for it, right in the mix of when everyone was getting sent home. Um, and this report really shows the economic value of the sector, um, where we analyzed different indicators, like, uh, for example, the number of employees in the sector, um, this year we analysed 764 different companies and there was close to 23,000 employees. 
We also look at the revenue of the sector. So this year it was, I think, just over 2 billion, if I can remember from the top of my head. And the information that we include in the, in the report is not an approximation. Um, each financial account, the public company information of the companies um, that we analyse has been brought. So we can give the figures down to the exact amount. Um, also within the report, we include um, success cases from different intermediary companies here in Spain. Um, how they're using the, the data that they've been able to gain access to. And we include two surveys. So we do, we've done a survey on intermediary companies, um, sort of to get their opinion of how they are in their market, um, also on the national and international. Um, also what problems are coming across, what sort of data sets would be of interest for them to open. And last year, for the first time, we put in a public sector um, survey as well on the 17 different autonomous regions in Spain. Um, one of the things that we really wanted to investigate there is if they were coming across the same barriers when they were trying to open the data. Um, yeah, so another way that we really try to promote the sector is we have um, the ASADI Award, which has just closed um, for this year. And we're now analyzing the, the, um, the things that the people that have put their name forward for it. So we've, this award um, promotes the good practice of individuals or companies or institutions for their work in the development of our sector. So you um, sound really like you do so many different things. Yeah, so I could go on. <laughs> exactly, I need to stop you there because otherwise, no, uh, there are a few that you named that are at least particularly very close to, to my heart and, and mm -hmm. I feel are very, very important. I, was, I wanted to ask you more or at least to, to expand on that. The, one element I notice is that one of your commissions itself is not just advocate, advocating for the release of the data, but actually doing some of the analysis that normally yeah. is in the hands of government, like assessing mm -hmm. if uh, there, is, there are risks for confidentiality or personal information being uh, revealed that should not. And all of this work usually is in the hands of government. And it is question, it's a burden, it, it, it's work and... and, and yeah, our our uh, commissions work very, very hard. So they work hard with us and it's another way where I'll go back to collaboration. Um, they collaborate. Essentially, all our associates and the people working in the commissions are direct competitors. They're companies that compete against each other. But um, over the years, I've learned how to work together to reach our common goals. So, you know, the, sometimes the more heads that you've got working on one thing, the more different ideas you've got and, you know, the more you can produce. So they've learned to work really, really well together with us and, yeah, it, it helps to see the results. Once they've got the raw material, the data, once it's open, that's where their competition begins. <laughs> so they yeah. go back to the... And then where the second point comes for me, that is um, the data you produce out of the sectors that you support is incredibly valuable. And um, uh, my, the team I belong to itself is required regularly to try to analyze the value of the impact of open data mm -hmm. on the market. Uh, to uh, the authors of their latest report, actually, in the call today. Yeah. And the, it's you. You can find, you can find all our reports on our website. Um, both in Spanish and English. So the oh. eight reports that we've got, they're all there. So, you can so Laura, see. Esther, I'm calling you out. You have one more resource for next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, and it would be amazing if we could persuade the other states uh, to do the same. Uh, yeah, well, we've, we've always been looking out for um, other associations like us in Europe. If, if there's any around, it would be fantastic to be able to be in touch with them and sort of like compare notes and because there's always different ways of doing things to so be able to push, use, push we, forward. We can use this video to make an official appeal. So if you are yeah. an organization, <laughs> advocate, <laughs> uh, please uh, get in touch with us and I said, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah that's find out about you. And and looks like the, the kind of history you have in the experience will be useful to them and vice versa. Yeah. Um, for the ones of us in the audience, I believe maybe more of a down to earth approach, a more pragmatic, let's say the techies, uh, uh, can you give us perhaps the, the story of, of, of one of these processes you, go, you may go through? So how do you work with it? So from the original idea of spotting one data set that is needed down to the point perhaps where you document the need and you start doing the actual 
lobbying work and then mm -hmm. get the data out and perhaps you get to the national portal. Can you give us the helicopter view of this workflow, let's say? How does it usually work? Okay, um, one example. So, um, as I said before, there's, um, we've identified many data sets here in RCD that are of use to our associates. Um, so I think at, at a regional level, um, here in Spain, I think you've got to realise for a start that there's, there's 17 different autonomous regions. So they, they all have their own responsibilities and they all hold their own information. Um, so, for example, you've got the national law um, and then each, which of course each region has to abide by, but then each region then specifies and details um, this law in, in their way. So they, they produce a sort of a protocol for, for that region. Um, so what happens is one data set, you've got to ask 17 different regions to open it if you want to have the overall picture of Spain uh, in that area. So for example, the commercial establishments. So you go to knock, knock, knock on each of them and say, oh yeah, we'd like this. So what we were doing in the past is we had this list, this extensive list, and we were just bombarding them with, we want all this open. <laughs> And so, of course, um, from a technical side of view, it's probably like, well, how are we going to open all this information? By law, we've got to have it open in so many days, et cetera, et cetera. And we saw that it wasn't working. Um, so what we did last year is we decided that we'd reduce this list and we'd choose a top three. So last year, we chose three data, sheet, data, seats, uh, data sets, um, and we decided that we'd push for these data sets to be open in all of the regions of Spain. Uh, so, for example, to give you an idea, when we started, I think there was two different regions that had the three data sets open out of 17. So, fantastic, they've got it open. You can do something with this, this information. But the more regions that open this information, the wider view, you've got a global image, and so you can produce better quality services and products. Um, from the raw data. So um, the three data sets that I'm talking about are the cooperatives, foundations and associations. So we started to push and um, from March last year when there was just two regions as I said, um, there's now to date uh, seven regions, uh, no, nine regions out of the 17 that have got the three data sets open. Um, so, for example, the one that we saw the biggest leap in was the cooperatives data set. So it's gone from having four regions with information open to 13. 13 of the 17 regions now have this information open. Um, so this is one of the ways that we thought, hey, well, look, what we're doing isn't working. Let's listen a little bit to the public sector as well, because our general secretary, um, she has different meetings or goes to visit the different regions or with other different identities, um, public identities in Spain. And um, sometimes she comes back and she says, oh, you don't know the hurdles that such and such is facing. So, for example, it could be um, like a legal hurdle when nobody's agreeing on what they can do with the information. One person saying they can't open it, somebody else is saying, oh, yeah, it can be. And we all know what happens when one person has a doubt that information isn't available. Or it could be like technical different problems as well, where they haven't got um, the, they haven't got all the information there. They've got to, or it could be something that's um, not their responsibility. So then they've got to get in touch with town councils. They don't have the time. There's not the resources, and and so on. So we thought we'd take a step back, we'll focus on three, and yeah, so we really pushed for that, and it's had great outcomes. I, I like how you reminded us um, the extra level of complication that federal states have. It's not just Spain, Germany, for example. So every, every state within the country ha is responsible for its own data mm -hmm. publication and collection, and advocating for its release is like advocating... 12, 20 times, depending on the local <laughs> yeah. locations. It is. Which doors you need to go knock and, and, and get the data out. So, yeah. And it's because all... each region as well has its own open data portal, which is fantastic because some of the, the um, websites here are amazing and they're really intuitive and you can find what you need. 
and all that sort of stuff, but then there's nowhere that combines it all. Yeah. So Spain is also famous in the community for being so active from the bottom up, let's say, from the, the city, yeah. so powerful. So it's all there. It's just going to be brought together. <laughs> and in a way, also, you complement the work done instead by the, the national and the international government. So, so, for example, next year, with the uh, enforcement of the public sector information directive, the new one, uh, we mm-hmm. will have the concept of high value data sets being progressively implemented across the states that are probably yeah. not too different from those three data sets that you targeted. Uh, yeah. yeah. So the register of companies is, I believe it's not confidential information, it's one of the data sets that is being discussed. Uh, to yeah, be that would be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we, on the list. <laughs> we will find out. Um, but Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. As many uh, of us, we've been advocating for those uh, data sets to be released because they uh, many consider I'm trying to be a natural here uh, yeah it's um one of, one of the barriers that we actually come across here um is in the present reuse law in Spain um it's excluded all the information that's um been collected by the tax and the social security administrations so like we find it really hard to believe that these two organizations are just blocked um they probably they do hold information that is predicted by law for privacy issues or whatever but i don't think that they can just generalize that all their information is unavailable for use so that's that's one of the things that we're pushing for um with the transposition of the the regulation now in spain it's one of the hurdles that stay tuned (laughs) stay tuned so before we go into the the questions from um people in the audience uh Uh The last question for you would be natural. What what's next for us? What 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 is the next front where you're fighting for getting data released, or what are the current campaigns? Well, just as I stated, one of the things that we're working on now is the we're following the transposition of the European reuse regulation into Spain. So um, in our CDA, in our lifetime, we've seen a huge advancement in the access of public sector information. But there's still some basic barriers here that really need to be broken down. Um, it's, and it's really important now because we live in this information society and some of the barriers are the one that I just um, commented on about some of the data being completely excluded. Um, another barrier that we come across is the administrative silence. <laughs> it's when, when you request a document from a different administration from reuse and then the said administration doesn't respond within its deadline. Um, in the present law, they've got 20 days to respond. And so if they don't respond there, they can um, request another 20 days. And then so if we don't actually hear anything back, you, so you understand, okay, they're not going to open the data. But um, it, it, actually in law, the request is understood to be denied if you haven't heard anything. So this is a huge problem because we don't know why our request has been denied. So, for example, we don't know if there's a law or regulation that's impeding its use, or we don't know if the data set is it's just not the responsibility of the identity, that, the public identity that we've asked or that we've requested the information. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll keep pushing with those things. It sounds um, like that will keep you busy for a while. Also, support. Yeah, th- there's, another one, there's another one as well that I'm just remembering. Um, at times, there's other regulations that can present barriers. And we've seen this with the, the data protection law. So what's happened is from the law, there's some indications that have been established for the public identities when they're publishing administrative acts or notices or things like that. And these indications have been aimed at preventing the identification of natural persons. And it's key to point out here, I think, from what you've heard me saying before, we're always looking for legal identities. We're not looking for individuals. The information we want is on legal identities. Um, And so, but we've noticed that in practice, these indications have been applied to the legal identities as well. So therefore, during the processing, um, so much of the entity's information has been anonymised and it's impossible to identify them. So, for example, uh, in English, if you have a company that's called Smith & Co, which in in Spain would be Hernández y Hermanos. So, for example, 
Smith & Co. is a very common name. So you might have in, in one area 20 companies that have got that same name or a similar name or something like that. So when this anonymization is happening, it's even becoming impossible for that company to be able to identify itself because there's 20 companies with the same name or a very similar name and they've anonymized it so much. So yeah, it's it another, is, uh, another one that we're pushing for. <laughs> it's a difficult territory. I mean, I lived in the UK until a few years ago and yeah. oddly enough in the UK, uh, the register of companies and the name of the directors are op have been open data for decades. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, be, uh, because for some reason, perhaps it's a part of the culture, right? They, they yeah. that a director as a person responsible for a company should not be a secret. It's like being the it's like being the front of the of the shop in a way. But yeah. culture will influence how the uh, PSI and, uh, director yeah, and, and slowly changes are happening. Like yeah, huge and, advancements have been made, as I said, but there's there's still certain things that need to. Yeah, Keep sometimes moving. you just need to give it time. Also, thanks to the advocacy work of organizations such, such as this. So, <laughs> thanks you. Thank Fingers you. Fingers crossed. Thank <laughs> you, and I will uh, now look at the chat. Uh, and uh, okay. if you have any questions, start preparing. Uh, we have, a I believe, about 10 minutes still to go, if you like. Okay. Um, there's a comment from um, Els uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, like we were noticing before, very interesting initiative, um, especially public institutions have certain legal obligations, at least principles to open up and share the data. Uh, this is mostly not the case for private sector that makes what you do even more valuable. And she also wonders how come there are not more Asedia out there. And we, we, we want we to know that too. <laughs> we are puzzled like you, as uh, so, so uh, we'll we, just have to spread ourselves everywhere. <laughs> yeah, we, we repeat our invitation if you are out there to, to come in, in touch with us. Um, so, so I understand we actually have no news of other associations of, of similar kind of nature. So it's very difficult to. That could come when we publish a video. When you publish a video. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, perhaps we know of non non industry driven ones. So mm -hmm. we know citizen organized ones, mostly usually associated to one specific problem that wants to be tackled. Yeah, one specific area. Perspective, but not industry ones. Okay. So. Um, this is this space is for you. I'm looking at um, the list of participants. Uh, I'm going to unmute you. No, we'll pre please wait for you to raise your hand or anything, uh, or <laughs> just yeah, to be too dangerous, right? Or uh, please write in chat if you have a question. If you're shy, write it down, and I will repeat it for you. Otherwise, yeah. you can, uh, uh, and uh, and put them straight in contact with us as well. All our details are on the website. But, um ACDA. What is it? Ah, I've gone blank. Yes. ACDA <laughs> at. Um, no, that's our email. So it's www.acda.es is our um, corporate email. Els also is asking if the uh, website also offers a version in English because you named some of your reports and stuff. We're working on it. Ah, you're working on it. <laughs> We're working on it. Um, yeah, that's my job. It's going slowly, <laughs> but other things seem to come up. But we're trying to, um, for example, the Asadia Award. We published um, all the information on that this year in English. Um, the the reports are in English, but yeah, slowly, bit by bit, we're going to be including more and more. And also the event you named earlier, um, uh -huh. by the way, the one we will be invited to. So we will. Yep, the to... the international conference. Uh, when is it? And can you can you tell us more? Uh, is it is going to be in Spanish, in Spanish or in English? Uh, is a point for um, everybody? Or... Generally, it's in Spanish. Um, this year it will be open to everybody, <laughs> um, because it will be virtual. We usually hold it in Spain in Madrid. Uh, usually, if I think back in the years that I've been there, they've all been in Madrid. Um, I think before my time, there was a couple of speakers that came in English. And yeah, but it's generally in Spanish because it's usually based here in Madrid. So the general audience are usually Spanish people. Understood. And but um, this year, I think there's going to be a few weird surprises and a few wee tweaks. I, hope because so. I don't think anybody in the team knows. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've got that in mind. We're, we're planning that. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, um, 
okay, just checking uh, one last time for the audience, is there any questions? Um, for the conference, uh, we will find information uh, on the website, I, I appreciate Yeah, so on our website, um, we'll also be on Twitter and LinkedIn, the other different um, social websites that we've got as well. And then usually the European Data Portal um, publishes something for us around the time. So, yeah. And they would not actually exclude, even if it is Spanish-centred, that is just natural because of the nature of your organization, I would not exclude mm -hmm. the fact that it will be interesting to other countries. The, the principle itself for the kind of research we do at the EDP that is the point, that is the experience made in one country is incredibly valuable to the other, even just for benchmarking to realize how you are performing or if you need help or if you're weak in some areas and strong in others observing what other countries are doing is only useful whether you are a civil servant working in other country or actually a citizen who would mm -hmm. like to realize uh, what the uh, scope of possible is and what an organization yeah. said you. It's, it's something that we can note down for future events um, as i said before we've got two different associates from other european countries one of them's from italy and one of them is from france um, this year, for example, um, our report, it's in English and in Spanish, but we also put an executive report, like a rundown in French on the web page. So, yeah, we're always open to ideas and we can note that down for some of our future events nice. to see if we can um, sort of open it up a bit more, as you say. Thanks a lot, Casey. I, I believe we can wrap up now. Uh, thanks to you and Asedia. Uh, thanks to uh, the participants who followed uh, from their homes and offices. If you want to find out more about Asedia, uh, Casey shared the website www.asedia.es. And uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> I've got to remember how to say it in English. <laughs> If you're here, uh, you perhaps probably know already about the European Data Portal and the Support Center for Data Sharing, but remember to follow both websites for the new sections so you will find updates on the future events. There's an entire new series of webinars coming in October uh, that you will find soon promoted. It's on the future of Open Data Portal, so probably relevant also to, to Casey as well. But I will keep you, I don't want to spoil it for you, so keep uh, come to our websites. Uh, follow our news and you will find out more. In the meantime, uh, thank you everybody uh, for participating and submitting your questions. And, and thank you very much for the invitation again. Thank you, Casey. See you next time. Thank you. Bye.